Well, good morning and welcome. Thank you for blessing us this morning, Linda. Uh, Our God is a good God, and in Matthew chapter 19, he says that with man, there are things that are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And so to the God of the possible, I encourage you to stand this morning and let's worship and give him the praise that he richly deserves. Praise the Lord. 
Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for uh, being our life. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being our Savior. Lord, as we approach communion this morning, we thank you for the sacrifice you made on the cross for us uh, bodily. And we thank you for the, the sh- blood that was shed for our sins so that it could be forgiven. God, we, we want to recognize that this morning, remember it this morning. So thank you so much for that. In Jesus' name, amen. May be seated. This morning we're coming to a time of communion. This is something we do often here um, as a way to remember what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Um, Communion is an act of obedience. Um, Jesus asks us to remember these events. Um, And so it's something that we do, again, regularly. Um, But it's it's a joyous time because we remember what Christ did, but it's also kind of a sorrowful time, a sad time, because of the sacrifice that Jesus went through for us. In 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 23, chapter 1, excuse me, chapter 11, verses 23 to 28, it says this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Then it goes on to say this. So so then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink the cup. And it really talks here about what Jesus did on the cross and what the sacrifice is all about. But it does say as believers, and and this is, our communion is open to all believers, to examine ourselves. And if there are things that we don't have right with the Lord, to get those right with the Lord before we come up and take communion. So if there are some things that that you just know that you need to confess to God um, so that he can forgive you, uh, because our confession, when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Scripture says that then do that right where you're sitting this morning before you come take communion. There are three parts to communion. First is our examining ourselves. The second is the bread um, that we take that represents Jesus' broken body uh, and the pain that he went through on our behalf. And it really reflects how much God loves us to do that, to take that sacrifice and that pain on himself. And then we have the cup, which represents Jesus' blood. And again, without him shedding that blood, we wouldn't have forgiveness of sin. So it really is about how Jesus loves us enough um, that he did that to forgive us of our sins. We're going to have the servers come up and prepare um, at the table. And what we're going to have you do is you're going to exit like we normally do, exit to your your row to your right, come up, um, be served the bread. Just hold out your, your hand and they'll drop the bread in your your hand, uh, eat that bread, and then you can take the cup, and there's uh, waste baskets here on the side that you can drop the cup in when you're done. 
and then return to the row on your left. Um, so if you're at home, if you want to gather the elements um, so that we will take that together at the end of serving the, the congregation this morning. So when you're prepared, go ahead and start coming up. And for you online, the body of Christ, broken for you, you are loved. Let's eat together. And the blood of Christ shed for you, you are forgiven. Let's drink together. Lord, again, we thank you for the sacrifice that you made on our behalf. Thank you for be, that because of that, we have forgiveness of sin, that we can live righteously and eternally with you. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.
Life is busy. Every day we ask questions like, what's happening today? What should I wear? How am I gonna fit everything in? But then there are bigger questions like, why am I here? What's my purpose? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? These are some of life's big questions, but there's rarely enough time to think them through. That's why Alpha exists. Alpha is a place to explore life's big questions in a safe and open environment. It's a series of sessions where anyone can share their thoughts and opinions and ask questions without feeling judged. When you come to an Alpha, you'll notice that first, there's food. Whether it's a full meal or a light snack, this is the time to get to know each other in a casual setting. Next, you'll watch an Alpha talk. The talks are created to engage and spark conversation. They explore big issues around faith from a Christian perspective. After the talk is a time for discussion. This is the most essential part of any Alpha. It allows everyone to share their own opinions on the ideas presented in the talks. It's a time for people with different thoughts, beliefs, and experiences to ask honest questions and have open conversation. Every week, there are guests coming for the first time to an Alpha in their community. Alpha is for everyone, regardless of background or beliefs. There's no pressure, no follow-up, and it's completely free to attend. Come and explore life's big questions. Find an Alpha near you today. We have a great opportunity for you, um, or people that you know, and that's Alpha, and it's starting Thursday, September 15th in the Great Room. It's a time for you to come and ask questions and learn. Um, maybe you are just checking out the Christian faith. Maybe you've been a Christian for a while and you just want to brush up on some of the different things we believe. Um, they're going to go over things like, what is the meaning of life? Who is Jesus? And why did Jesus have to die? Um, this is a great course. It starts with a meal, like, you, like it said on the video. It starts with a meal. It's highly relational. So you get to ask any questions you have. No questions are off limits. A time to explore together in a group of people um, that you'll get to know. So we encourage you to sign up for Alpha, or if there's somebody you know that would benefit from Alpha, you can sign up uh, today. You can sign up online. There is child care uh, for those 10 and under to make it just as easy as possible for families to come and learn about Jesus. So check out Alpha. Uh, again, you can check that out online. We also have small groups starting up. Some small groups are starting next week. Um, we're going to be doing a study off the book, Everybody Always is what it's called, and a Right Now Media uh, presentation also. If you are interested in being part of a small group, there's still time to sign up. You can check the tables out in the lobby. Um, you can also sign up online, but it's going to be a great way to get to know other people, study together, and get connected. Um, as you know, small groups are one of those ways that we can make a big church smaller and get to know people and really in impact each other's lives. It seems like there's one other announcement that I'm... Oh, you know what? This reminded me of it. Um, right after church, after this service, there's a Sunday brunch. I have really good cinnamon rolls, egg bake, and all kinds of stuff. So make sure right after this service, go downstairs, check out the brunch, get something to drink so it, sw so it washes down, um, and sit, sit at a table with somebody you don't know. Get uncomfortable. Um, and get to know some other people. We all have name tags on today, so it's an easy way to get to know people. Just a great way, again, to get this community of believers that we call our church, Alexander Covenant Church, to get to know each other and, and uh, just have a great time fellowshipping together. So each service, um, right after the service, downstairs, egg bake, cinnamon rolls, juice, all kinds of different things, come down and enjoy that together. And as always, we take an offering at the end of the service. You can also give online a variety of other ways, but it helps support the ministry of Alexandria Covenant Church, not only here, but around the world. So thank you for giving generously.
Well, good morning, church family. Yeah, pretty good for 8 o'clock. It must have been that cinnamon roll, which if Brian has to eat a cinnamon roll in every service, you better get down now after the service because there won't be any left by the end of the third service, almost guaranteed. This is the, uh, the first Sunday in September. It's Labor Day Sunday, and it is the unofficial, unofficial, it's supposed to be 90 next week, end of summer, and the official start to a new year, in a sense. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like a New Year's Day for the fall because we got school coming up, uh, our rhythms change, discipline changes, and things just uh, work differently come the fall. And as we launch into this new season, as you've noticed, there are things starting up here in the church, and I have a question for you to wrestle with this morning. And that's this, what does it look like to get better? What does it look like to get better, to become a better husband or wife, to become a better employee, a better student, uh, to grow in your faith and mature and deepen your relationship with God? How do you get there? What does that look like? Uh, The fall tends to be a time when we think about the next grade or the next season in work or the next season in church. And there's naturally those questions and how, what did I learn from the last season and how do I move forward into this next season with excellence? And today we're going to unpack what the Bible says about growing and specifically why you need community in order to grow. So if you would bow with me and pray with me and for me as we look at the Word of God this morning. Heavenly Father, I pause right now to recognize that before your greatness, I am humbled. Before the knowledge, knowing that you sent Jesus Christ to start a group of 12 men who knew you through him and who carried the message of the gospel to us today through their faithfulness and obedience and through their small group. So God, I pray this morning as we unpack your word that you would speak to us, that it would not be my words that remain in our hearts, that it would not be my tone or my presentation, but Lord, that it would be your word that firmly takes hold of our heart, reads us this morning, and teaches us how to become better people, more like your son, Jesus Christ. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to pull them out now. Uh, We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4. This is going to be the main text that I'm in today. Ephesians chapter 4. You can find the notes in uh, our online app, the Bible online as well as a great tool. Uh, And of course, there are a few Bibles in front of you. I'm going to be reading primarily from the New Living Translation today. So if you have an ESV or NIV or different translation and you're like, the words sound a little bit different, uh, that would be why. So Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 11, says this. Christ, I'm sorry, now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Pause there for a second before I continue on to verse 14. A couple things to point out here. Number one is that these gifts are given to the church from Jesus Christ. That when he left and gave us a mission to do, he didn't leave us empty-handed. And these gifts are in the form of people, right? These are individuals that he's put in the body of Christ to build the body up. His reason is to do his mission and carry on his work and build up the church. And there is a goal, and that goal is looking like Christ. So now on to verse 14, and it says this. Then... We will no longer be like immature children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. 
It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Each part of the body is brought together by Jesus Christ and necessary for growth. There is not an individual in this church who isn't necessary for our growing as a body of believers. And therefore, spiritual growth requires responsibility. Spiritual growth requires responsibility. There is zero way that we grow outside of being in relationship with each other. And Paul made that definitely clear in Ephesians 4, that every one of us plays a very specific role. And those roles, as a cumulative effect, as a whole group, we grow each other. In the spring of 1964, uh, a young woman by the name of Catherine Genovese returned home to her apartment in Queens, New York. Uh, she had just got done working a night shift and was on her way home in the very early hours of the morning, and it was still dark out. And as she approached her apartment building, she was attacked. Somebody had followed her and attacked her. And it was later come to find out as they were interviewing people at the apartment that 38 people had heard what was going on right outside the door. And one of those 38, only one of them, took any kind of action and opened the window and yelled out the, the window, told this person, hey, stop it, knock it off, you know, be quiet, whatever they said. And the attacker left and then came back, and because of her injuries, she succumbed and lost her life. And from that one incident, in psychology, a term developed, and it's called the bystander effect. The bystander effect. The bystander effect means people are less likely to offer help when other people are present. That they're less likely to offer help when other people are present. So somebody in, in the mindset, listening to somebody else get attacked outside their apartment building, was probably thinking something to the effect of, somebody else is going to step in and help this lady out. Right? Somebody just will. Because there are other people around, this is an apartment, I can tell their lights are on, so I'm not going to do it because there's going to be another person to step up and step into the situation. That's called the bystander effect. The assumption is that others are responsible. Uh, because I am going broke and I can't use my kids anymore in, uh, in my sermon illustrations, uh, for those of you who don't know, I do pay them when I use them in sermon illustrations so I don't wear them out, uh, I'm now going to use my mom. <laughs> Somebody asked me the other day, when you use an adult, you give them money to? And I said, once you're 18, that's it. So you're cut off. I will ask permission, but that, that's, that's it. Um, you can have a cinnamon roll downstairs after the, after the service. Uh, so the bystander effect, I've noticed this, and my wife has pointed this out to me, that when I'm hanging out at my parents' house, I become a bystander real easily. Because I know that my mom is going to make food. <laughs> She makes food, and now we, before, when we first moved up here to Alexandria, we lived with them for a few months before we found our home, and every morning I'd get up, and my coffee would be there, and an omelet, and some fresh fruit, and my mom was amazing. She'd just always make all this food, and my wife would just give me these dagger eyes, you know, like, really, you can't get up and get your own food? And I'm like, why not? My mom's just going to make the food. It's perfect, you know? Just bystander effect. Because if somebody else is going to do it, that means that ah, I can just kind of stand back and, and not do anything about that. That goes away really quick when I am up, like I was this morning, at 4.30, preparing to speak this morning. There was nobody around besides the cat who was looking at me and wanted me to feed him. And the only person who was going to feed me if I was hungry is me. Because if I see the responsibility and know that nobody else can do it and understand that if I want to eat, I have to do it, then I take responsibility. That is the bystander effect. Um, I heard a story about four men in a life raft, and they had been at sea for a little while. Their, their boat had gone down, and they were in a life raft, and two men on one side of the boat were watching two men on the other side of the boat just furiously just bail water out. And the guys that were not bailing, one of them leans over to the other man and says, oh, praise the Lord that the hole is not on our side of the boat. Here's the point. <laughs> we're all in this together. We are all in this together. That as a church family, every single person 
that calls themselves part of the body of believers here in Alexandria Covenant, if one person feels it, all people feel it. If one person does well, all people do well. That we have responsibility with and for each other, and don't take my word for it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. It says this, A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Let me read that again. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. There is no such thing as a bystander in the Christian worldview. There just isn't. When you read scripture, what you notice is that God does not reward apathy. That he has given us, all of us, a gift, a talent, an ability, something that he left with us individually that he intends for us to use to make other people better. And seeing Brian up here with the cinnamon roll this morning, boy, I can just think that there's a lot of people downstairs with the spiritual gift of baked goods. <laughs> and there are. And I know that there are certain individuals in this church, and if you're in here, you know who you are, that if you make something and drop it off at church, no matter what it is, I'll eat it because it's that good. You see, we make each other better. That God gives us giftings to serve one another, to expand our faith, and to grow our confidence in Christ and to become better people. Uh, Emil Brunner, who is a Swiss theologian, uh, a very famous Swiss theologian, uh, responsible for a lot of the ways that we think today, uh, he said this, one who has understood the nature of responsibility has understood the nature of man. Responsibility is not an attribute, It is the substance of human existence. It distinguishes mankind from all other creatures. Think about that for a second. That one of the ways that God's image is imprinted on us is that we are capable of responding. That we are capable of being responsible, taking ownership for something that may or may not be ours that we do for somebody or something else. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and all this should be familiar to some extent if you're in the one-year Bible read-through, because we just went through 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 26 and 27 says this, if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Each of you is a part of it. In other words, we live responsibly and we live humanly as God designed us to live. And Paul goes on about that responsibility that even in another person's suffering or in their honor, we rejoice or we grieve with them. Uh, Two examples of this that I saw uh, a couple weeks ago before our ministry fair. I was here late one Saturday night just setting up for the ministry fair. My wife and I were at the table just kind of getting things ready and, and, and making arrangements. And Pastor Greg, who I did ask permission so I could share this story, uh, Pastor Greg, he was in the building kind of doing some stuff, hanging out. And he's kind of a night owl, so I'll see him once in a while if I'm in here late too. And uh, he comes up to me and he says, hey, Dave, uh, do you know where I can find a, a push broom? And I'm like, it's kind of an odd request. Like, it's Saturday night. Like, what's he use a push broom for? Like, we have carpet in our offices, so I'm trying to think, okay, what's going on? And I just, okay, yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's one in the closet over there by the door, and he went and found it. And about a half an hour later, I left the building, and I see Pastor Greg out in the parking lot by the flagpole down there, sweeping all the rocks that had washed from the rain the night before out into the roundabout. And I thought to myself, you know what? That's not his job, but he took responsibility because he cares about people seeing our church for the first time, maybe, they're coming this fall, for seeing our church in its best light. And he saw something and he attended to it. And I had a lot of love and respect for that man before, but it went through the roof when I saw that he's given up a Saturday night just to sweep the parking lot and take care of something and be responsible for it. Right? That's what I thought too. That's responsibility. That is responsibility. One other story, and, and this is a very personal one, um, I, one of my biggest struggles as an individual uh, is anxiety. I struggle with anxiety. And uh, in coming up to the fall, there's a lot of details with my sp- specific job here at the church, and a lot of things were going on in my head, and, and it was just a lot taking place, and, and I was having a rough day. And so 
I called one of the men that are in my Thursday morning men's Bible study. And we've been meeting for about a year, and I just, I deeply love these guys. They are, they become brothers, and we share life together in a lot of ways. And so I, I sent a text message to one of them, and I said, hey, um, would you pray for me? Because I'm really struggling, and these things are going through my head, and I can't shut it off, and I'm feeling really anxious. Five minutes later, I get a phone call. And one of those men called me up, and he said, hey, I'm just going to sit down here in the, uh, in the patio section at Menards, and I just want to pray for you. I just want to pray for you. And I thought, I thought, really? My God, you've blessed us with people who not only take responsible for parking lots, but take responsible for another person's anxiety. And he cared for me. And it about brought me to tears in that moment because I didn't expect that. And he didn't have to do it. He could have just texted me back, but he called me up and prayed for me over the phone. And that is an example of what it looks like when somebody uses their spiritual gift to further the faith of another person, whether in serving or praying in so many different ways. Spiritual growth requires responsibility, and spiritual growth also produces fruit. Spiritual growth also produces fruit. Uh, You may or may not be asking this question at this point in my sermon. Am I using my God-given ability or gift to build the church? Maybe you're asking that, maybe not. Uh, it's a natural tendency is to go through those thinkings when you're, when you're listening to somebody talk about the text is, okay, well, how does this apply to me? What does it look like in my life? So if you're asking that question, this is the answer, right? That fruit is the result of if we are or are not using our, our spiritual gift to build each other up. Uh, Jesus taught that you can recognize or measure an individual by the usage of their gifts and the fruit that they produced. So in Matthew chapter 7, uh, just setting the context for this a little bit, uh, there were some teachings that Jesus was doing. This is kind of towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and he's teaching about false prophets. So somebody who uses their spiritual gifting in an unhealthy and uh, unfruitful way. It does bear fruit, but not in the way that God intended it to. And so here's what Matthew 7, chapter chapter 7, verses 15 through 20 says. It says, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. And a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. The principle is what I'm driving at right here, and that is we know if we are using our spiritual giftings to build the church by the way it produces, by the fruit. And this morning, if you go downstairs, you'll be able to taste some of that, literally. (laughs) Somebody else using a spiritual gift. Our actions reveal who we are. They just do. And if it's true, and I would say it is because it's very clear in Scripture, if it's true that every single one of us in this room has a spiritual gift, the question is for all of us to ask ourselves individually, are we producing the kind of fruit that comes from us using our gifts to build the body of Jesus Christ? And I want to talk about a few of those different fruits that are in Ephesians 4. So if you have Ephesians 4 open, you can just look at it. I'm just going to list a couple of these out. One of the fruits that we see is Christ-likeness. That as we become a user of our spiritual gifts, we become more like Jesus. We just do. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control becomes the banner of our life. We become like him in that we become selfless, that we become aware of other people's needs. So many times in scripture, Jesus will be walking through a crowd and the text will say something like, he had compassion. Or he saw someone who was blind or lame or, and he recognized a need. You see, Jesus was always looking out at other people and attending to them. He was using the the God nature of who God made him to be in, the, in this, that God, he was using his God nature incarnate to minister to people because that was his mission, was to do good work 
on earth and to reflect who God is in the flesh. And that's what Jesus did, God in the flesh, Christ-likeness, which is what we become as we use our spiritual gifts as he instructed us to do. The second thing that I, I put down on my list of fruit that I've noticed from Ephesians 4 is stability. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed that's happened over the course of uh, COVID and the recent um, political climate that we live in is there's a lot of instability that new teachings kind of crop up and people start thinking different ways. And I, I get a lot of this as a pastor. Somebody will come and say, hey, Pastor Dave, I heard this or I heard that. And then what do I think about this? And there's all these kinds of movements back and forth. Stability comes when we become mature in Christ. It's a fruit that we're not just blown about by every new wind of teaching and tricked by lies that people try to tell. Another fruit that I put down on here is that we join truth with love. See, if you have love without truth, you have hypocrisy. If you have truth without love, you have brutality. But love and truth combined bring a wealth of growth to people around you. That if somebody who loves you comes to you and tells you a hard truth to hear in a loving way, what does it do? It makes you better because you learn about something that you can grow in an area that you can become better in. And the last one that I put down on my list here in, from Ephesians 4 is interdependence, interdependence. So if you are independent, independent means I do it myself. It means I'm self-reliant, I'm unaccountable, I just do it myself, and no one, I'm not going to answer to anyone, I'm independent. That's independence. Codependence is I can't be who I am without you, and dependence means you're going to do everything for me and have control over me. Interdependence means we do this together. And that is how God gave us to each other in the body of Christ, is that we are not independent, we're not codependent, we're not dependent. We are interdependent with each other so that as I share my prayer request with a man for my Thursday morning group, I'm giving him an opportunity to respond and build my faith. And as he shares his needs with me, he's giving me an opportunity to respond and build his faith. And that is interdependence. That is how God designed us, is to be interdependent. So if you examine your life and you don't see fruit, don't feel bad. Don't feel bad about that. Let God's word challenge you and correct you. If you think, ah, I'm, not, I'm not producing fruit and I'm not building the body up as it's said in the text, then the next best step is to move forward in that direction. Spiritual growth happens in a group. Spiritual growth happens in a group. You can't one another, love one another, serve one another, encourage one another without a one another, right? You need each other. And that's why we need groups of people. I would love to, as a pastor in this church, I would love to know everyone in this church's name and story intimately. I'd love to know how you came to Christ. I'd love to know about where you work and the highs that you experience in life and the lows. And, and I, I would just love to know all, all the people in our church, but I, I can't. And one of the things that I've noticed in our church is that a, a general sentiment that happens at times is I feel disconnected, right? I feel disconnected. I feel like I'm not connecting, that, that you have a very friendly church, but I'm having a hard time making friends. And while I would love to step in and befriend everyone who feels that way, I know I just can't. And so as the pastor of adult formation, the pathway that I've created for that is groups. And there are a lot of people in this church who either are in a group or serve in a group or are part of one. Spiritual growth happens in a group. Um, one of the things that I, I love to do in life is I love camping. And just recently, I was in the Boundary Waters with six other men from our church, and we had a great time up there. It was fantastic. Um, when I do the trip next year, if you're interested in going, you should talk to me. It's just so fun. One of the things you learn from camping is that your experience is directly related to your responsibility. Your experience is def directly related to your responsibility and who you camp with, right? <laughs> You get out in the woods and all of a sudden you're at that trail and you got to portage your canoe and all your gear. And if the people you came with weren't eager to do that or help out, you're going to be carrying an awful lot of stuff, right? <laughs> if you forget your sleeping bag when you get out there, you're going to be really cold, especially this time of year. 
You see, camping reveals something about the urgency of having to take care of needs. And the men that I went with, I loved. They were so fun to spend time with. Everyone, we didn't know each other really well, but everyone just jumped in and did something. Carried a piece of equipment, cooked a meal, washed some dishes, did, and we just had fun doing it together. And that's how the body of Christ should be, is that we see a need and we go to meet it, especially knowing how we're equipped and what we're good at and how we can, how we can serve the larger whole and what we can do as individuals. When you're a part of a group, it makes you better. You learn from each other. When somebody shares something, you learn from that. You get to support each other. You accomplish things together. You celebrate. Uh, you motivate each other. That's what groups do. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 says this. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. This verse 25 you should underline. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. An isolated Christian cannot grow. If you only attend, and hear my heart in this church family, if you only come on Sunday morning and sit in a row, you're not going to grow. You'll hear the word of God and it'll challenge you, encourage you, but you need a community of people to live the word of God out in. We need to be with each other to discuss what we're learning, to talk about it, to act on it, to live it out. We need to be in a group. Plan for your spiritual growth. Plan for your spiritual growth. I want this for you, I want this for us, and I want this for God. I want our church every single person to find a place here where they can use the God-given gift that's been given to them. And some, some are up front, some are behind the scenes, but every one of us has one and we are all challenged to use it. And these are the four types of groups that we have in this church that you could be a part of. Okay, I'm gonna show you these four types of groups so you understand what your best next step could be. The four types of group groups are as follows. There's a slide for this too, so you can kind of get a feel for them. When you see these icons and you see the colors, you'll get an idea of what types of groups that we have here. Because in different seasons, we need different groups. We have care groups, right? There's the red circle with the heart in it. Because in life, we experience hurts and hangups, right? We need celebrate recovery. We need grief share or divorce care or financial peace university, which is starting in October. We need these kinds of groups because we have a pain point that needs to be addressed. And so a skilled individual with a plan comes alongside of us in a group setting, and we get better and grow past those things and, and learn how to grow from them. We need different types of life groups. What's a life group? A life group is an extended group. So this group of men that I meet with on Thursday morning, I've been meeting with for a year, and they know my life, and I know their life. There's a high degree of accountability because we know each other, of care because we know each other, something that's different than if you were just go to Sunday school, right? You know people and there's acquaintance, but the level goes much deeper in a life group. These are people that you do and share life with, and your commitment is to them as individuals, not to the day and time you meet. I mean, you have to have a day and time to meet, but your commitment is to the people in the group in a very specific way. And then there are different groups that we have study groups here, the yellow circle. The study groups, by the way, are starting this next Sunday. We have Sunday school. And I know Craig bierke has got a great class he's going to be teaching, and John Philbrick will start his the week after. And those are fantastic study groups. And we have Bible study fellowship and other classes where you can deepen your knowledge of the Lord and fall in love with him and have discussion about theology and, and talk about these fun things that we get to know God more intimately through. And the last one is one that you can sign up for when you walk out of here today, and that's a connect group. If you have not joined any kind of group and you're just floating around trying to figure out, how do I plug in? What's my next best step? It's to join a connect group. It's six weeks. It won't take your entire year. And it's a very fun study. We're doing Everybody Always by Bob Goff. And the whole point of it is to get to know new people. So don't join a connect group with all of your best friends. <laughs> For six weeks, you can find people you don't know to get to know. And the cool thing is, if the, if the word of God is true, and I believe it is, then meeting new people means getting exposure and meeting new giftings that God has blessed our body of Christ with, and maybe being grown in new ways. 
for six weeks, join a connect group and get to know people. And my biggest encouragement to you is this, don't do nothing, right? Jump in and use the gift that God has given you to bless each other. Because all of you, if, <clears throat> if you have said yes to Jesus Christ, then you have a gift. And that gift is meant to build the body of Christ. And so my encouragement to you is to do just that. To get off the bench, to get into the game, and to use your gifting to build the body was the mission that Christ has left us with. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I'm always challenged and humbled when I see what your word has to say about being the body of Christ. And that it's not just one person or a couple of people, it's, it's all of us. And so, God, I pray that you would first and foremost convict my heart and how I can do what I can do to build the body. And that each one of us in this room would find places, find groups, find ways to be involved with each other so that we can grow each other and do the work that you have called us to do. God, thank you and praise you for giving us your word to challenge us this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please, please stand and sing with us. So may God be glorified in our church as we go from this place and use our giftings to build each other up. And by the way, you can start by doing that this morning by going right downstairs and getting yourself a cinnamon roll. So be blessed and go in the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and have a great day.